So, uh, hi there, and it's a big coup for us here on Clock in the Gallop today to have a big name in racing, certainly a name that uh, has been in the headlines in the past couple of weeks for all the right reasons. And that is none other than uh, Greg Bortz, who joins us on Clock in the Gallop. And Neil, just from your side and my perspective, we thank Greg for his time and for availing himself. For, I know he's an important man now as far as Cape racing is concerned, so a lot of people want his time, but he's uh, been... Uh, thankful enough uh, to give it to us well, we're thankful enough for him to give us uh, about half an hour of his time this morning yeah uh, good morning to uh, you nico good morning to greg i must say first of all greg i also wanted to wear aquamarine to honor your colors but uh when i've got the 1.4 million yeah. viewers behind then i disappear on screen so you would have just seen a head instead of uh, a body so i had to revert to the the red but good morning to you um great to have you on board and um, yeah, Nico is going to sort of drive the conversation, but it's good to have you on. Uh, we had you on Super Saturday, the first show, and now we've got you on Clock in the Gallop. So thank you on both counts. And awesome. Great to be here, guys. Now, Greg, I want to uh, uh, cast our minds back again. Um, picture this. Um, it's a, 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 I think it was a Wednesday, uh, mid-morning, Neil, 2013. They've asked me to... Um, commentate on the gallops for a ready to run sale at Turfentain and the horses are coming out and just before they came out I needed to grab myself a cup of coffee so I go downstairs I grab myself a cup of coffee and I see this unknown face to anyone and I walk across to this guy and I said morning how are you um, and he of course was with Caroline Simpson I don't know if Greg remembers it but Caroline sure. Simpson was in charge of Bloodstock South Africa and she says Nico meet Greg Bortz Greg is here to buy horses and I said, oh, yes. And, and Greg, uh, he says, yeah, I'm back from America. I've been involved in racing. And, um, and, it was, and, and it was there and then that we met. And I'm just so sorry that I didn't tell him which my best horse on the sale was because it ended up being a nice horse called Cool Chardonnay, Neil, um, uh, which was lot 99 on that sale. I looked back and, and saw it. But Greg, just from that day onwards, now, it didn't start there. It didn't start there. Although you came back from America and you were, in South Africa and you wanted to get seriously involved in buying horses. It started way before that. So just tell us a little bit about your history when you lived in Durban and then you went to Varsity in Cape Town. Tell us a little bit about that period. Before I, before I tell you that, I have to tell you, I remember that clearly. Um, boy, did they see me coming. Yeah. Like, talk about paying school fees, that sale that you're referring to, I bought every three-legged animal that existed on that sale. <laughs> really? Yeah. I think my win ratio from that sale was somewhere between 0, 0.0 and 0. 0.1. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we, we live and we learn, you know, those are the best school fees. So, um, yeah. yeah, and I, I mean, listen, I can't keep uh, reinventing the story since, you know, there's been a few... There's been a few other interviews and stuff that I've done, so I don't want to uh, belabor things that are that are already out there. But I mean, for me, it started as 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 a youngster. I would say. I mean, I got into racing when I was nine years old. Took my first PA when I was nine, and um, um, you know, through a through the late Martin Sternberg. That's how I got introduced to the game and 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 the great David Payne and things of that nature. But as with all punters. You know, I think we've all got those great stories. I mean, I'll never forget. I'll never, ever, ever forget that. And um, those were the days when the Alamites came out. They weren't published, right? And you used to go and have to, you have to get, be able to spot Alamites in the parade ring using your buy knots. And if you had, if you had graphed from the stable that you could get it before. So like my whole punting in those days about you know, getting the Alamite report and we get mm. faxed around the illicit illegal Alamite report. You know, those were the days. Mm. And I remember once going to Clearwood Racecourse. I'll never forget this, going to Clearwood Racecourse. Uh, race and I had with me, um, I think, 200 rand. I mean, I was like, you know, I was happening, right? I, I had the full 200 large in my pocket. It was going to be a huge day. And I went down to 10 rand. I lost 190. We got to the last race. And I decided... Okay, so I looked at the tote board and there was a horse, I'll never forget, called Safe Custody, okay, paying 275 rand away. What? Okay, yeah. Okay, 275 rand away, right? Yeah. Okay. Those days, I think it may have been 18 horse field, Safe Custody, 275 rand away. I said, okay, I'm going to take 10 rand. I'm going to put it on Safe Custody. But I was hungry. 
So I spent five rand on a big jack pie and a coke, okay? So I was left with five rands. So I stick five rands on safe custody, which comes home lonely, okay? In the ninth or 10th race, okay? um, to this day, my biggest mistake in life has been eating that freaking pie. <laughs> you know, double down safe Was it good? Were you just, just quickly from a punning perspective, were you backing it because of the price or because yes. you liked it? Yeah, you're back in, no, in those days. Yeah. In those days, there were, I think, there were, there were, I think, eight gin strikes in the race, shoes right. for the first time, and that was one of them. Okay, and it was also a blinker strike, and it was, as I said, 275 rand a win. Someone will find it somewhere. I mean, the great Google will get the yeah. results on the safe customer. Absolutely. But I'm interested but, uh, yeah, on the personal notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. I just want to ask Greg on a personal note that um, you're not eating too many pies these days. I mean, when I first met you. You were never, uh, you know, you were never what they used to call me chunky, but you're looking a million dollars. Um, you obviously gym, you work out, you eat well, which we've all got to do it uh, the older we get. But uh, I have to say, having known you for some time, I've never seen you look better. So you, you've stopped eating any pies, even if they cost five rand. No, I got the call. I got the call. Conti called me. He said he's having a problem, Neil. He's got a problem in the back four. I've been called up. <laughs> So, you know, out of love and deference to the great Tottenham Hotspur, I'm just getting myself a uh, game time ready. I have to say, in previous uh, reincarnations of Spurs, you would have easily got a game. I'm not so sure now. Okay. We're on the up and up. But, exactly. Um, we'll talk a bit about those. But do you look fantastic? Uh, back you. to you, Nick. I know you were yeah. out of thought on your mind. Nick, I didn't really. I got distracted. But bottom line yeah. is, was into racing from, from a young kid. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, and... My whole, my whole sort of high school, college, I mean, as a school career, I used to sneak into the race course. I used to hitch to Graver all the time. That was like, that was my thing. I absolutely loved racing and that carried on. And this is, uh, you may have heard me mention this before, but probably it's funny how life goes full circle. But so when we were, when I was punting, my book of choice was winning form. Some people use computer form, some use the race card. I used winning form. I went to Cape Town to UCT. And when I got there, I went to the totes to go buy a winning form and they didn't have any winning form. Winning form didn't exist in the Cape or they didn't sell or distribute them in the Cape. So, and that like, that messed with my mojo because that's the only way I could study form. You know, we're all very particular, peculiar folks. We all have our methods. So when I went back after my first holiday, I think it was in March or April, I went back to Durban um, on a varsity holiday and I went down to winning forms offices. And I got the address off of the back of the winning form. And I went there and I knocked on the door and there were two people sitting in the office. One was Matthew Lips, um, who you know, um, who at the time had a page at the back of the winning form called Magic Lips. Um, great, great tipster. And the other was this guy um, wearing shorts, no shoes. And uh, I went up and introduced myself and his name was Owen Heffer. And so Owen um, was the founder and owner of Winning form, and this predates Hollywood bets, of course. Hollywood bets didn't exist; it was just winning form. Mm. So that's when I met Owen. And the thing about Owen, what I loved about Owen, first of all, there was a young first-year varsity student, and there's this guy, also a young guy who's launched a business, and he launched a business in the, in the area that he's most passionate about, which was horse racing. Yes. And that is what defines Owen. It's just absolute sick love for this game. It's like all of us, we just, he's just mad for it. So I said to him, listen, I cannot get it. How do I get it in, 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 in Cape Town? How do I get winning form in Cape Town? And that led to a discussion and I became the winning form exclusive distributor in the Cape. Okay. So I started distributing winning form books and my entire varsity career was not only launching winning form books, but then worked with Matthew Lips to launch winning form Cape Town. Because at the time, winning form only had a Durban book and a Joburg book. Right. And so that's how I met Owen, and that's so. Then I leave. I mean, I go through my varsity career, and then I leave South Africa, and that was in 1994. Um, I left South Africa because Spurs signed Jurgen Klinsmann, and that was my calling. And I left South Africa to go to go watch Spurs, and that was me. Yeah. And that was the last time I saw or spoke to Owen. And what's funny about that is, in the big picture, I know you wanted to talk about the the, the Kenilworth Racing yeah. um, you know, transaction. And obviously, um, you know, Hollywood Bets is front and center in that transaction. It's funny how the world goes full circle. 
and I reconnected with Owen now. And it's I actually it's as if I'm chatting to the same guy that I that that I saw, you know, wearing shorts and no shoes in 1988. You know, um, yeah. Now he's got yeah now yeah, now he's got shorts and and shoes on, but he's got shoes on now. Yeah. On a good day. <laughs> on a good day. So now, so now, when you went overseas and you start this big business, um, and you're in the in the banking world, and and you you're doing your hedge funds, and and you're doing all your business, and you're very successful businesses at that. Uh, you've got no interaction with horse racing at all over there. None. I it's mean, not the same. It's 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 just foreign to you. You out of it. Completely. No, it was. Well, first of all, um, I don't know if 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 you guys feel the same, but me being sick for South African racing always has been. I've never quite enjoyed the UK racing as much as I do South Africa. There's something about the way our commentators commentate and their level of enthusiasm and excitement. And whereas it's, it seems very staid and, you know, when, when they're commentating and here comes so-and-so and he's going up, you know, whereas if you got, you know, you, Nico or, or Alistair or whomever giving it the full Monty, I don't know, there's more passion to it. So, but when I left South Africa, don't forget, I left pre-internet, right? Which means it was impossible to follow. Mm. I couldn't follow what was going on in South Africa. So it ended, right? I, so I stopped following South Africa. And when I got there to America, and they, they would call the horses like, here comes the three horse past the quarter mile pole. And I'm like, what language is this? For God's sake? <laughs> like, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't find a connection. I also happened to be, you know, having arrived there as literally as a very poor immigrant. I never had the luxury of certainly not money, but certainly not the luxury of time either to learn and, you know, in a new environment and a new sport. So I just lost it completely. And I was lost to racing literally until by pure chance when I came back to South Africa in 2012 and I was looking at apartments to rent and I happened to walk into an apartment owned by Bryn Russell and he had pictures on the wall and that was how mm. that just rekindled it. And then through chatting with Bryn and, you know, let's go to the races and that's how the French developed. And then it doesn't take much in this game for the spark to rekindle. Mm -hmm. Nico, if I can come in um, here and I, I suppose we, we must all tread a bit warily because um, this isn't a, a, a Bloomberg channel, not as in the Robert Bloomberg channel. I meant as in the, in the facts and figures and numbers channel, but, there's a lot of stories, and this myself included. I always thought Greg was from Cape Town, so I've learned something already that it was dirt, and I'd heard mutterings. But because of, of where you are and you've come into the game and your horses are prominent, your colours are prominent, and you're even more prominent, uh, there are some, you know, you, you get stories that are embellished uh, along the way. So I wanted to, without putting numbers on it, otherwise we're going to sound like the Live Tour, and uh, that soulless is all about numbers. Um, the, the, the story... And is that you you built a business, then you sold a business to a big bank, and then the financial crisis came, uh, but you had already sold the business, but then you rebuilt that business again and resold it again. I mean, that's the story doing the la uh, the rounds. Is, is that in encompasses what happened to you and what you what you did in your business world, Greg? I mean, and yeah. I'll leave it to you to embellish as much as you can, but is that generally the story? Because it's a great story I tell. Yeah. When people ask me, yeah. tell me about Greg. Uh, and that's kind of what I say, <laughs> but I well, don't know whether yeah, it's right. And, and, yeah, so but just, yes, that, that is roughly the story. I'll give you the exact facts, but it's a little different in that the business that I built was a business that bought businesses. So my actual business was a, was a, was a holding company, and I went out and I bought troubled companies. So my company owned seven or eight individual companies. One made meatballs. One made socks. One was an insurance business. Okay. So when I sold in 2007, I sold the holding company and sold it to a group of banks, one major bank in particular. Um, and so that was that. Then the financial crisis hit and those banks got into financial distress and had to get bailed out by the US government. And the US government said, as a condition for us lending you all this money and bailing you out, you have to get out of your non-core businesses, okay? You've got to focus, get back to banking. If you're going to take money from the government. So the business that I sold, which owned these individual businesses, was one that was considered non-core and they were required to get out of those businesses. That's how it happened. So when I went back in, when, when now I was sitting with some cash in my pocket because I had just sold in 2007 
the world was now crashing and now I knew they had to sell. So I went back and I cherry picked a few of the individual companies out of the whole portfolio that I had sold them. So I didn't buy back the business. I bought back individual companies that I had sold when I sold my business, if that makes sense to you. Mm. Um, and so from that, and, and that's, it, it cost a lot to buy them back. That was like $1. Um, they were literally just, <laughs> it's a fire sale, just take them. <laughs> You know, yes, um, and it's similar to some of the, the challenges we're facing in racing today. When you're dealing with, in the, these were businesses that were in a stage of turnaround and were in financial flux, which means they needed to be supported with money while they turned themselves around into a healthy state. And it just so happened at that point in time, the banks no longer had money to help support them through that period of time. So they were only too happy to just take them off their balance sheet, if that makes sense. So, mm -hmm. so the post-financial crisis, I had uh, three businesses out of the seven I had sold, I took back in, which I funded, fixed, turned around, and then subsequently sold again. Okay. So now, Greg, let's get to, to the present. And, and we look at it now and we say that when we look at racing in South Africa, it's, it's not recently that it's been on a downhill slope it's not even when COVID hit that we're on a down we're downward slope for quite a time now and you know we we come now to to post-COVID or, or these areas post-COVID and you've got a distressed Cape racing scenario you've got a distressed South African racing scenario and you're a huge investor in the game uh, you've put a lot of time and money into it um, you love it your passion's about it You've previously sat on, I think it was the property committee um, of, of Kenilworth Racing. So you know a little, you know more or less what's going on behind the scenes. But now you come to this stage when you feel that it's absolutely necessary to get involved. Now, were you approached to get involved or did you off your own bat say, look, this is going nowhere. Um, you've read about the fact that the NHRA are about to relinquish the Cape Racing's license to operate down there because of uh, the financial constraints. How does Greg Bortz now say, it's my time, I need, I need to get involved here, I need to put my hat in the ring? Um, firstly, I was not approached, um, so that never happened. Second of all, um, I actually sat, I was invited onto the board of Kenilworth Racing. I forget the exact year, um, maybe it was 2016, I'm guessing, um, or 17, I don't know exactly. And I was on for very short. Yes. And I was on for very short because I got into an argument with the CFO and a few other representatives of Pumalela in my first board meeting because they just brought on a lot of debt and the purpose of the debt was to pay out dividends and I just said that it was just it's mindless and ridiculous and it is reckless and I was told I didn't know what I was talking about I said you guys are insolvent and I don't want to be I, I just can't be around this life's too short and I resigned promptly and a few other board members at Kenilworth Racing heard what I said and followed suit and resigned so that was my very brief intro and uh, i mentioned that because i think you it's so important that people get this backdrop which is racing is in decline because not because of problems in racing it's in decline because there's competitive competitive dynamics in the marketplace it used to be that racing was the only legal way that you can bet unless you went to sun city right um way back when and then when things changed and now you can bet on many other many other things from sports to games and what have you racing is competing for a share of the wallet right um so you got to understand there's that competitive dynamic first and foremost so you've got an industry that's under threat from other forms of entertainment other forms of gambling entertainment that's the big picture but then it got involved in self-inflicted pain and the self-inflicted pain was just incompetence poor management greed um, all the worst of it. I'm not going to sit here and name names, but Pumalela filed for business rescue. Okay, it needn't have, it shouldn't have fallen over if it was managed properly and there wasn't hubris and all the other worst things associated with it. 
if you're in a shrinking business, in a shrinking industry, let me just tell you one thing you cannot do. Pay dividends. Yeah. Uh, dividends means you're paying out of excess profits. Profits yeah. you will not need in the business. But who in their right mind could look at Pumalela and say, this business is really shooting the lights out. There's so much surplus profits here that we can distribute to shareholders. So that, that is self-inflicted. But anyway, that's, that's so it was all smoke and mirrors, way. basically. It's all smoke and mirrors. I mean, they were they were really uh, putting it out there as a, as a great investment. I mean, I know people intricate to the business, Greg, that were telling to yeah. people to buy shares at twelve and fourteen and fifteen rand, say it was going to get to fifty rand. I mean, there I are got told by, I got ex- told by a- there are senior executives that are yeah. on record in financial publications as saying it was guaranteed to get to 50 rand well it would have got to 50 rand and and that's why my interview with mike de cockneil you'll remember this i said thank goodness COVID hit because we may never know what might have happened to racing yeah it's, there seems to be common themes i mean i've heard that from a few south african companies i was also told that by a very senior executive a board member within pumalela that uh, at 24 rand it was a cracking buy yeah at the same time i was told that uh, steinhoff was undervalued too so the um you know, these things should should sell themselves. But the point being in racing is this, it's an industry under threat. Not, it's an industry under threat from competitive dynamics of other forms of entertainment, which means if you know that that's the competitive dynamic, you've got to cut your cloth according to your means. You've got to keep things tight. You've got to keep things small. You've got to box smart. You've got to be nimble. You've got to be flexible. What don't you do? Don't put on debt to pay dividends. So that was the ultimate that was the ultimate. So when I saw that, but anyway, so that was, that's more of the history. So I was, I was just mentioning that there. I've mentioned my Kenilworth racing history. And then when we get to today, how did I get involved? Um, obviously, I have a, bit, I have a background of, of turnaround. And this happens to be an industry that I'm passionate about in terms of horses. And it was just clear that this was an industry slash company, Kenilworth racing, that need turning around. Um, and I read a lot while never being involved, never being involved, never being invited in, never being called, never being contacted. There was a lot going on. And I just saw certain things happen, which I could just tell were not the way I would handle it. In my mind, if you do, if you invest in a distressed company, there are a few major things you have to do. Like there are a few like pillars to doing something in a turnaround. The first is, You've got to fund the business to achieve success, meaning you don't put in just what's needed to get through the next month or next six months. You've got to say, what's my five-year plan? Do I have enough money there? So the first thing that jumped out at me is I saw lots of things about financing or refinancing of debt that was coming due at Kenilworth. And that, that seemed to be the, the number that people were focused on. I'm like, well, what does that fix if you can deal with that debt? Where's the funding needed to actually fix and run the business so that was the first reason i looked at it is because i hadn't seen that part of the narrative that somebody said no you actually need x to achieve this five-year plan and someone needs to fund x i hadn't heard that that was the one thing that i'd seen that that sort of got my attention the second thing that's in a turnaround if you've got a business that's distressed the golden rule is you don't back people that perhaps oversaw the business falling into distress don't back them to get you out of distress right you've got to reinvigorate and freshen up and i hadn't heard anything about a, a, a management solution at kenilworth and kenilworth it was particularly d- dire for the simple reason that kenilworth in, in essence outsourced management to pomalela it was run through a management agreement kenilworth used to get invoiced every month for ceo services for cfo services right massive amounts marketing, of marketing accounting all the things financial. that they were handled there so the point being is when, when pumalela fell over it wasn't like kenilworth had its own people in those seats because those it was being run by jovic so there was also a management gap and in in, in the things that i'd read and i was just reading the, the same press that you guys would have been reading I never saw anything like what is the management solution because it couldn't be run from Joburg. That had been tried and failed. To try that again would have not been smart. 
you needed to have a solution. I didn't hear any of that. So I said, I'm not sure that I'm seeing this happen the way it should happen. Um, and so that's how I got involved. And around about the same time of me looking at getting involved proactively, you know, I learned of, of, of Hollywood. And Hollywood, obviously, we'd, we'd seen, you know, how amazingly supportive Hollywood have been at, at Gold Circle and in, in KZN, just been fantastic. And it was just amazing to hear that they would consider extending that sort of um, investment and support to Cape Town. So, so it was just, at that point, yeah, go ahead. Just pause there. So pause there. So now the options open to you as Greg Ports are you go this alone and you say with your background and, and the state that Cape Racing's in that you're going to fix it and, and you'll provide the solution. Or you say, I need partners to get involved with um, from the Cape, um, and, and you look for those. Or you say, well, there's Hollywood putting their names forward, my history, uh, going back, as you've discussed, uh, there's some connection between the two of you. Let me discuss it with them and see whether we can come up. And now you come up with a solution that it is a, effectively Hollywood and yourselves that, are, that have put their names into the deal. And... And, and some may, people may frown upon you for that to say, well, what, Greg, why didn't you, why did you have to include Hollywood in this? So if the question was, did I have the financial ability to do this on my own? The answer is yes. Okay. I could have done this on my own if I had wanted to. However, I mentioned to you a few moments ago that this business was managed remotely from Joburg, which means there are not necessarily enough key people in key seats and enough um, there within Kenilworth. For me to go and do this alone would have been madness. Um, similarly, to go out and, and bring in other, other financial partners, that's probably just bringing in money, which isn't, which isn't the biggest issue. The money is crucially important in this case, but the biggest issue is actually having the expertise, time, et cetera, to help fix this business. What Hollywood brings to the table, so I would say the following, one rand from anybody that's willing to contribute a rand is worth one rand, okay? One rand from me, I would say is probably worth around 50 to two rand because I bring more than money. I bring some know-how, some knowledge, some expertise. One rand from Hollywood is worth four rand, right? What do Hollywood bring to the table? They bring so much to the table, but like, where do you begin? But to say that they have knowledge and expertise, certainly in this general sphere, is stating the obvious. Um, um, Kenilworth's, I would say, betting platform is obviously um, is, is not where they would like it to be. There's no fixed odds presence. It's the, the, the tote is in, in massive decline. Uh, Hollywood success speaks for itself. Um, for those that haven't had the pleasure of meeting Owen, the one thing about him is, and I'd sit back and think, well, why has Hollywood been so successful? The first answer is Owen Heffer. Mm. But if the thing is, if you ask Owen Heffer why Hollywood has been successful, he wouldn't mention that as a reason, right? And not just because he's, he's, he's modest, because he's, I don't think you'll find anyone more modest than Owen. And in fact, you won't see him doing what I'm doing, right? I'm answering all these questions on it. And the main reason I am is because, you know, the Wizard of Oz is not to be seen, right? Because yeah. he's the most modest, humble man you will ever meet. But Owen will tell you the secret to the success that he has in Hollywood is the team that he's built. Uh -huh. And his team is exceptional. So there is depth in all the, there's depth in all the areas. Um, you know, and Kenilworth needs to build up its, its team. And Hollywood can bring so much to the table uh, in terms of expertise and, and what have you. And so given the extent of the turnaround here, it needs a completely holistic approach. It needs everything in Hollywood brings that so in terms of the but you alluded to the um like why bring hollywood in or you know as if it's a it's a bad thing 
that, I, I mean, that to me, I find fascinating. That's even remotely um, something that people would even consider. Um, go back 20 years is the argument the bookmakers are evil. Like, not only have, has that fight or war come to an end decades ago and been lost by the racing operators in their fight with the bookmaker, it's been stated by the courts that what the bookmakers do is appropriate. So you can't sit there and, and, and that fight's finished. So that's just old. And for people, as you keep hearing, they bring that same thing. It's like, get with it. If you want to move something forward, stop looking back. We're yeah. not sitting in 1995. Okay, we're in 2022. Like, be proactive and fix it. So that can even waste time listening to that old stuff mm -hmm. about the bookmakers and the open bet. Being there, done that. The question that comes is, of course, is this a partner that gives or contributes to the industry? I'm like, that's like the, the easiest thing ever. I mean, is there anybody that, that does more for this industry um, in terms of their, their sponsorship, their commitment, their support, whether they're buying horses or sponsoring or what have you, they, you know, it's, it's just self-evident. So they have expertise, they have leadership, they have a team, they are constantly giving back. They have created more jobs for the communities in which they operate than, than most um, could ever hope to. Um, philanthropic on every level, they lead and they lead with the right way. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't partner or, um, with anybody that didn't have, that I didn't share values with and didn't, didn't operate the way that I would operate. And I consider myself extremely, extremely fortunate to have the opportunity to partner with them. And the only reason I'm sitting here is because they choose not to hog the limelight. In addition, we must be honest, I've got to state this clearly, there is no transaction until all the regulators have signed off on everything. And it's another reason why you won't see Hollywood. They, Hollywood cannot proceed with this transaction until the Competition Commission and other regulators have approved the transaction. So um, they are as respectful as to the process as anyone um, could expect to see. Um, and they're just sitting back. I'm, I'm slightly different because I'm not part of that process. I'm stepping up today once I get other regulatory approvals. Um, to make, um, to fund the business today. Um, Hollywood are, are, are by, by design, they need, to, they need to wait patiently and they're doing just that. But um, we're all better off for having them leading the show when the time comes. Perfect. And again, I could just come in to say, yeah. um, I've been particularly quiet um, because I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Uh, we don't have that much time left. We've got four minutes left, but uh, my contribution has been minimal, Greg, because uh, you are just eloquent. You've explained everything that we need to know. I'm going to leave it to Nico to maybe ask you one final question uh, that he'd like to ask, but thank you for your time. It's been fascinating. So, um, Nico, back to you. Yeah. Before you ask that question, I just want to say one thing, because this is, um, since I last saw you guys at the, at the July to now, there's obviously been a lot happened. The announcement came out and all of that. There's been a lot in social media and what have you about it. And there's a lot that was said about, you know, there's always going to be those naysayers sitting um, behind their keyboards having stuff to say. And that's fine. It's a, it's a free world. Everyone can say what they got to say. Saying what a sweetheart deal this is. Um, and I said to anybody that thinks this is a sweetheart deal, I posted my cell phone number on all the Betty, on all the chat short. I said, call me, sweetheart deal. I'm inviting you to invest alongside, okay? This is a sweetheart deal. Come put your money alongside mine on the identical terms, right? Or alongside Hollywood's on the identical terms. And then you'll see sweetheart deal. So the point that I'm making is this. Nobody in their right mind on the basis of what is a good investment to make would turn around and say, Kenilworth Racing. Now that's a home run, okay? Mm. What is being done is being done because of passion and love for the sport. And if you were to know why Owen um, is interested in 
buying Kenilworth Racing. It's because he loves racing. Hmm. We all lose if anyone loses. I'm now not talking about the deal. Now I'm talking about all of us that love racing. It is imperative that for racing, Gold Circle and Kenilworth Racing all succeed. If any one of the three fails, we all fail. Go back however many years, there used to be 600, 700 meetings a year. We struggled to get to 364, okay? We are all interdependent. We rely on our mutual success. And what you are seeing from Owen, myself, from Maud, from Mary, and what you're seeing are people that are just passionate about the game and want to see it succeed. And we all have to. So if there's stuff being said, there is no, if there is rivalry and what have you between operators, that's silly. We all need to succeed. We all need each other to succeed. Well, I'm going to end up not asking a question because we've run out of time, but just to, to say thank you very much, Greg, uh, for coming on. Um, we, we thank you from a racing perspective for contributing uh, to the cause. Uh, we know it's in the right hands. Um, we might not have said that before, but there's a lot to fix. There's a lot to fix and there's a lot to change because uh, Cape Racing is, as we said at the start of the program, in distress. And they've continued business the same way, expecting different results. We know that uh, famous saying, and we know yeah. that you're going to make a change. Greg Bortz, thank you very much for, for appearing. We hope to have you on again in the future to say how Anytime. things have gone. We know that you're very open and you'd be very amenable towards us on Clock in the Gallop, and you're also a big fan of us too. So we thank Thanks you for that too. And, and thanks for your time, Greg, and all the best uh, for the next step forward. Awesome, guys. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. All the best. Thanks, Greg. Cheers. Yes. Bye.